Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And last week, Neil Webb gave us an introduction to corrosion and cathodic protection. And using medical analogies, he reminded us that corrosion, particularly of a steel pipeline, can be caused by soil conditions, perhaps the presence of bacteria or chemicals in the soil, electrical interference, which may originate from DC rail systems or overhead power lines, and even the presence of active and passive cells, such as with concrete encasements. And in order to mitigate against this corrosion, we need to take action. And Neil reminded us that a very effective form of action is the use of cathodic protection. As an overview, cathodic protection isn't just black magic, but uses applied external currents and an external anode to convert the pipeline into a cathode, which will not corrode. Now, if you missed last week, you're welcome to pop over to the Isifundi website and catch up the session. Today, we're going to focus on SACP and ICCP. And before I stumble over this sound, what they are and how they work, we'll hand over to Neil. Thanks. Welcome everybody. As we delve into these um, acronyms and the title of our presentation today is in fact decrypting the acronyms. That doesn't mean to say that they are graveyard subjects. They are in fact um, technical terms, but as in any industry, there's always jargon and so we're going to try and um, make these things somewhat more clear. You'll remember from last week that when we're talking about corrosion in the electrolytic sense, we have anodes and cathodes on the surface of the steel, which were set up by various aspects of the environment. One other option that we have is that we can have two different metals. This also sets up a corrosion cell. And in the um, example that I'm showing now, we have an anode, which is iron, and that is connected to a cathode, which is copper. And you may say, well, that's a rather strange combination. Why would we do that? It is unfortunately something that occurs all too often in industry. You take a, um, a buried steel pipeline and uh, it terminates at say a reservoir or it comes from a pump station or something like that. It is iron, which is in the ground. And the electrical and civil structure to which it is connected has an earthing system. And that earthing system is inevitably copper. So we have iron and copper together in the same ground, in other words, they are in this same electrolyte and they're connected because the pipeline iron is connected internally to a pump, which is connected to a motor, which has an electrical earth that goes to the earth system, which is copper. And then we have a corrosion cell built into our new structure. Our topic really though, is how do we protect iron? So we need to find metals that are anodic to iron as opposed to cathodic, which is the copper situation. Well, one of those is zinc. And zinc is all around us. I'm sure you have seen roadworks and civil construction and so on, where they have piles of stone in metal baskets. These metal baskets are made of galvanized iron. Galvanized iron, is merely iron that has been coated with zinc. Another example is steel storage tanks are coated in zinc. And this picture shows you both a steel storage tank up here, which is also um, <coughs> has good corrosion protection properties. But these structures in the air do not actually involve cathodic protection, illustrating that zinc is a common material. So in the in the situation of a cathodic protection system, we have a zinc anode and that is connected. Here's the zinc anode. It is connected to the iron cathode, 
by means of an electrical cable. They're both in the same electrolyte, and so the zinc will corrode and protect the iron. If we have a look at a series of data, which has been drawn up over the years called the galvanic series, we see that there's a whole host of different materials listed there. They're all metals. The ones that we are interested in are the ones down at the bottom of the table. And in particular, we want to look at what is the, the material that is in and around iron. So we've seen already that copper is cathodic to iron. So if you couple iron and copper together, the iron will corrode. But if we couple iron to any one of the other three materials that are listed here, aluminium, zinc, or magnesium, then those materials will corrode in preference to the iron. And when they do so, they will ensure that the iron becomes the cathode and the iron does not corrode. And so the anode corrodes, and that is where this acronym comes from. Now, we don't want that anode to corrode away very fast, so we have to ensure that we use the correct anodes for the correct environments. And we will delve more into this in the, in the next session where we look at sacrificial anode cathodic protection. It's much easier to just say SACP. We'll look at SACP in more detail. I'm sure that most of you are aware that ships have cathodic protection on their hulls. And this cathodic protection is used to prevent corrosion of the ship's hull. So now you say, what on earth is that? That's a rust bucket of note. Well, I deliberately chose this particular photograph because it illustrates a very important aspect of cathodic protection. And that is that it only works when the hull above the line is not protected by the sacrificial anode cathodic protection system. Below the water line, we have these anodes which are welded onto the hull of the ship. And there you can see the anodes with their internal straps, which have been welded onto the hull of the ship in order to prevent corrosion when the ship is sailing. Now, these um, zinc anode marine systems on ships typically last from two to five years. That's what they are designed for, so that these anodes can then be swapped out during uh, dry docking operations. Another structure which is often or it's always protected by cathodic protection are offshore structures such as drilling rigs and production wells and so on. This photograph is of a drilling rig and the part of the rig which is below the water line which if you have a look at this photograph you can see this area that is black that is the area that is below the water line normally the moment is being transported that area is protected. The alloys the al that are used for these um, offshore structures are usually made of aluminium. And the aluminium alloys are specially made for this purpose so that they will, in fact, corrode. You may think that aluminium um, is actually something that doesn't corrode because we use anodized aluminium all the time in order to give us the architectural finishes that we have. Well, if we were to put that aluminium um, into service as a cathodic protection system, it wouldn't work because the aluminium has a passive film on it. That's the anodizing. So these alloys are specially made in order to remain active and provide current for the cathodic protection system. And these systems can be designed for extremely long periods of time. Many of the offshore structures which have these sacrificial anode systems on them have now been in service for in excess of 30 years, and the systems are still functional. Structures are not the only things that we protect using um, sacrificial anodes. This is a photograph of an offshore pipeline under construction, and there you can see the anodes welded onto a bracelet that is attached to the pipeline, and when this then is submerged after it's been launched out to sea, those anodes will provide corrosion protection to the pipeline. 
whilst we're on the subject of pipelines, onshore pipelines, which is perhaps what most of us are familiar with, can also be protected by SACP. So there's a photograph of a coated pipeline under construction. And in order to protect it, we have to go back to one of those principles that we spoke about last week. You'll remember that we mentioned that uh, in corrosion, we can get what is called long cell action. In other words, the anode and the cathode are quite some distance apart. Similarly, in cathodic protection of buried pipelines, we separate the anode from the pipeline. And you'll notice that the anode in this case is magnesium. And um, if we were to go back to that table of the various materials that are anodic to steel, we'd see that magnesium is the one that is the most active. And the reason why we use magnesium is that because it has a, a high driving voltage in order to provide the current to protect the iron. So in the pipeline situation then, we have the sacrificial anode that is buried in the ground adjacent to the pipeline. It is physically connected with a cable. The electrons flow through the cable, the metal corrodes, and the pipeline is protected. This is an example of an actual installation where the anode cables are brought into a link panel that is mounted in this case inside a valve chamber and then the pipe is connected to those anodes. You can see over here that the anodes and the pipe are on a common connection and then there's a monitoring point that is connected to the other cable which allows us to monitor whether or not the cathodic protection system is working. One of the issues with magnesium anodes is that they have a relatively short life. And you may say, well, 12 to 15 years, that's long. But not really when you're talking about a pipeline that has an operating life of 40 years minimum. So one of the challenges with magnesium anodes is that they have to be replaced regularly. So what's the alternative? Just before I go on to that, this is why they need to be replaced. This is a picture of a piece of a sacrificial magnesium anode which has almost corroded away completely in a very short period of time. And the reason for that is that the magnesium itself is so reactive that it just corrodes by itself. So an alternative to magnesium for onshore applications is zinc. And the problem with zinc is that it is closer to steel in that galvanic series and therefore we have a limited current output. And so therefore, the zinc anodes can only be used in situations that need low currents. Did you know that you actually have a cathodic protection system in your own home? There it is, in your geyser. You will have a sacrificial anode in order to protect the steel inner tank of the geyser from corroding. So let's now move on to the other acronym, ICCP. What is ICCP? Well, go back to that discussion last week on corrosion of pipelines, and we were saying that electrical interference causes corrosion of pipelines. And firstly, if we have direct current that leaves the structure, it causes corrosion, but conversely, direct current that enters a structure provides protection. So if we've got some means of forcing current to enter a structure, we can provide cathodic protection. And that is where this term ICCP comes from. It stands for Impressed Current Cathodic Protection. So we are impressing a current on the system using an external power source. There is a photograph of a typical um, impressed current cathodic protection system on a large diameter overland pipeline um, in a remote area. I'm standing over the top of the pipeline there you can actually see the gabions through the riverbed. There's a valve chamber. Over there is the impressed current cathodic protection system. And coming in from the right over here, we have the incoming power. So we need to have a power supply for these uh, systems. Where does that power come from? Well, the first, perhaps most obvious system is grid power. 
It can come either from an electrical utility or it could come from a municipal source. Um, and that grid power has to be converted into a low voltage DC operation um, in order to provide the cathodic protection. We will be looking at a little bit more detail at these, these options when we cover cathodic, um, impressed current cathodic protection in a couple of weeks' time. Sometimes, if there's no grid power, one has to revert to the use of diesel generators. And these work extremely well, but of course they are maintenance intensive and you've got to keep them filled with diesel and you've got to um, service the generators and the, the um, uh, diesel engines and so on. Some of the pipelines, not all pipelines have the, the um, facility, but it is possible to have micro turbines attached to a pipeline. These can operate either from the water pressure or they can run uh, off gas if it's a gas pipeline. And these micro turbines can then generate power also through um, alternators or generators that are connected to the turbines. If you've got a gas pipeline, you can use the gas to drive a thermopile, which is just a whole bunch of thermocouples connected in series and parallel in order to provide you with a DC power source. The new pink fuel cells. Everybody's talking about fuel cells for everything. Well, you can in fact use fuel cells for cathodic protection, provided of course that you uh, supply them with fuel. The sun provides us with photovoltaic energy, but of course that only happens during the day. So what happens to our pipeline at night or whatever other structure we're protecting? When the wind blows, we see these wind turbines all over the place. Similarly, they can be used for cathodic protection, but what happens when the wind don't blow? Well, we have a thing called batteries. So, for, me, for both solar and wind, where the supply is uh, intermittent, we have to have some means of ensuring that the supply is constant um, 24 hours a day. And for, for that purpose, we have to use battery systems to back them up. Now, I'm sure all of you know that you cannot provide power with only one wire. So we've been talking about one wire connected to the pipeline. Where does the other connection go to? Well, it goes to what we call an anode or a ground bed. These anodes are then located in the ground some distance away from the pipe, and they are designed to corrode as they discharge the current. One of them, the real long-term stand stalwarts of the industry is what we call silicon iron, more often nowadays silicon iron chrome. These anodes corrode relatively slowly and provide us with um, 25 to 30 years service life without any problem. However, they are heavy and somewhat difficult to, to use. The latest development over the last maybe 20 years or so has been the, metal, the mixed metal oxide coated titanium anodes. These have a very thin layer of activation coating on them and they can discharge DC current for a long period of time. Platinum anodes are used extensively in the marine industry. Magnetite and graphite anodes have been used in the past. They are perhaps falling out of favor these days, but they do have specific applications where they are still preferred. And then we do have some special anodes in the form of conductive polymers, which are also capable of discharging current for an extended period of time. These anodes then are located in the ground some distance away from the pipeline. This photograph is of a, um, an impressed current ground bed where the anodes have been embedded in a conductive coke breeze backfill in order to improve their electrical contact with the ground. And these cables that you can see, this is a positive ring main and each of the anodes is connected through an individual cable that is spliced into that, that ring main. So it's a fairly complex electrical system in that it is absolutely essential that these systems are perfectly insulated so that the cables themselves do not get damaged. This is, gives you an idea of some of the variety of the uh, mixed metal oxide titanium anodes that are available 
And these anodes are used for all sorts of special applications, um, including the cathodic protection of concrete. The big advantage of impressed current cathodic protection system is the magnitude of the system. Because it is driven from an external electrical power supply, it is possible to protect large structures, so long pipelines, for example, or large diameter pipelines. The systems can have long life, provided the anodes are correctly designed. They can protect systems or, or structures which have got very poor coatings on them. You remember when we were talking about sacrificial anodes, we had to look at um, structures that had very um, small currents. Well, in ICCP can provide very large currents. And of course, it can cater for a whole host of different environments, wet, dry, cyclical. And in doing that, we need to, we are able to control the output of the ICCP system. Whereas with sacrificial anodes, there's very little control. Once you bury the anodes or submerge the anodes, you get what you get. You can't do much about it. Whereas with impressed current, you can control how much current is in fact impressed into the system. They're also very easy to monitor, particularly these days with cell phone reception and um, things like that, where you can send data from your system back over the internet in order to check what is happening. But ICCP also has its challenges. Nothing is all easy. One of the biggest challenges, of course, is that the ground beds for, for these impressed current systems are located some distance away from a pipeline. So instead of just having a pipeline servitude of a few meters, you've got to have additional land available for a ground bed. Now this photograph here, again, standing over the top of the pipeline, you can see a valve chamber over there, just on the edge of the picture. And then over there, a couple of hundred meters away, is the anode ground bed. And so that is additional land that has to be procured in order to uh, install the system. A lot of systems use vertical anodes instead of horizontal anodes, but these of course are dependent very much on the geology of the system, of the environment rather. So if a system is, has a hard rock um, underlying the pipeline, then deep anodes just don't work. There you can see a, um, an ideal a horizontal ground bed installation. We're adjacent to a natural pan and in fact the trench that has been dug in order to install the anodes is already flooded with water which gives us a very low resistivity uh, contact for this ground bed. We need to make sure that the power is continuous. In theory, grid power is continuous. Um, if it's diesel gen sets, um, they've got to be serviced and maintained. The integrity of power is particularly important if we have pipeline systems which are subject to electrical interference. On the subject of interference, the pipelines that are protected by impressed current are more susceptible to interference or more susceptible to causing um, interference. So if you've got two parallel or crossing pipeline systems, you will find that an impressed current system is more prone to cause interference in the foreign pipeline, perhaps a sacrificial anode system would be. Unfortunately, uh, in many countries around the world, vandalism has become a major issue and the um, Power system integrity is a prime target for thieves and vandals in order to get some material that they can then sell for scrap. So neither of these systems is perfect. They have their advantages. They have their disadvantages. Where do we go from here? Well, in the next couple of lectures over the next two weeks, we're going to be exploring some of the details of both sacrificial anodes and impressed currents. And perhaps the biggest question that we always have to ask is how much current do we need to provide cathodic protection and for how long? And that question 
is something that you need to look into the future to and based on that you then decide what system you're going to install that's all for today and i'm going to hand you back to our coordinator thank you neil um i think i now have a better grasp of some of the role players in cathodic protection we look forward to having you join us again next tuesday as we delve a bit more into sacrificial anode cathodic protection and why this old-fashioned system could be the answer to our successful cathodic protection future.